You know, one, one thing that I realized, it's not really for the faint of heart, right? It's really not, like, we, we've been brought up and there's religion all over this country, but, but it's really not this gospel, you know, pursuing this gospel, knowing this gospel, pursuing God, it's really not for the faint of heart. And sometimes it takes me a way to go on vacation and even get a greater understanding. When I was on vacation, what was really neat is um, my grandson, Jason, who ran into Sunday school, and there was little Caden that was there. And when we first got to our, uh, our home that we rented, it had a jacuzzi. And, and it had a pool at the house as well. But you know what's really funny, children? Like, they swam last year, but they forget what they do this year. And so it's like they would go in the jacuzzi because the jacuzzi was like five feet and they would, you know, they could trust that. They could trust themselves in it. And I watched these two. And I watched them as they progressed. By the time they were done, they had no floats on, they were in the pool, they, they're going. But, but the Lord started teaching me something. See, this gospel is not for the faint of heart. We need to trust God. We need to get in the water with God. We need to pursue God. See, if we only experience God from a dock, and you never untie your boat, you're never going to see everything that God has for you. You'll never get this vision. You'll never want to climb this mountain. You'll never want to do any of that, because what will happen is we get satisfied, we get content in ourselves. But it takes more and more to jump into that water and start swimming. So today, I'm going to continue because I started looking at all my notes and I said, oh boy, this is a, this is a communion Sunday. I'm saying, I'm in trouble already. Uh, so if uh, this morning, if you would open up your Bibles with me, the second Corinthians, I want to get right after it, chapter 5, I'm going to read to you verses 11, 21. The uh, Bibles that are in the pews is page 1121. Um, and this was a sweet word. I read this all week. And then I started highlighting. And then I started underlining. And then what happened, I said, oh boy, this is going to be a long one. So hold on to your hands. I hope you give me grace today because I miss you so much. So here's the word of God. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to start reading from verse 11. I'm going to read to verse 21. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known to also your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance, not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that the one that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all. That those who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him for whom their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God has reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May the Lord use his word today to cultivate our hearts. So, some points I want to make out of this is that the, how does this sit into the gospel, this reconciliation? The first point that I'm going to make this morning is form, it forms the head and heart to a proper reality. The second is it motivated in God's love. Thirdly, it's applied through God, the Holy Spirit. 
And then the fourth is, is the first and foremost from God through Christ and represented in us. And then finally is the one true gospel. So as we read this text, a couple things. We know this is all about reconciliation. It's easy to understand. So if it's about reconciliation, there, there's something that's implied when we're speaking about reconciliation that there's an opposition. If there wasn't an opposition, what would you need to be reconciled to? And so having that mindset that is all about reconciliation, the Greek word is catalyst. And then Paul uses it in Romans 5.11, receiving reconciliation, which is implied it was given to him. So it's a gift. And in Romans 11.15, it says he's reconciliation of the world. And then even in the text we read today, the ministry of reconciliation, the message of reconciliation. So there's this broad spectrum and umbrella of this reconciliation of from, you know, to God, to the world. And, and so as we, we look at the text today, I want you to see God's heart for the gospel, for you in this text today. Also the tone, the tone is interesting in 2 Corinthians because there's much suffering in this text. When you read 2 Corinthians, it's all over the place. Verse 1-5 says, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. 2 Corinthians 2, 4, For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of my heart, of heart, that many in many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. This tone of the letter is pain and suffering. And and you know, when we think of pain and suffering, we think of it because it's caused from a lot of bad choices. This is the whole problem. And this is why Paul writes this letter. Because people were questioning his ministry. How can he be in so much pain? How can you be so much in suffering? How could you be in prison? How could you be beaten? How could you be shipwrecked? And you be this apostle you're supposed to be. In fact, he addresses it in chapter 11. He talks about these super apostles. But truly to understand all this, Truly to understand the cost of all of this, you need to understand the Creator. And that's where we've been going in this series. Truly to understand the Gospel, you have to understand the God. We've been there, right? And if you were to truly embrace this great hope and faith, you have to embrace the journey. And some of it might be pain and suffering. Paul was writing this letter to the church in Corinth to encourage them to follow, stay the course with the gospel that they heard and accepted. And what's very interesting in his writings as well, Paul never loses focus. He doesn't dwell on the fact of his suffering. What does he do? He points everybody to Christ. Philippians, the goal, the prize. He never loses focus. It's so easy for us to lose focus, isn't it? When things are going bad, things are in pain, we say, why God? He's living out this reality, and yet he's pointing everyone to Christ. There's hope. There's a prize. There's a goal. Run the race. Be steadfast. Be unmovable. Paul explains this in a way that defines his ministry. And it's defined in Christ. And his message of reconciliation is his voice given to him by God for them. And you want to know something, Christ follower? It's your voice too. He's given you a voice. Second Corinthians 5 11 says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what is what we are is known to God, and I hope is known to you, known also to your conscience. It's, it's interesting again, we've got a bunch of therefores in the air. So I want you to see them this morning as bridges. It tells us to go back, but it also sets us up going forward, using them as bridges. So what is he talking about? He's going telling us, okay, if we were to go back, we've got to go to back verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. When we get a proper reality of this, the whole idea of, of this reconciliation, why would we share the gospel? This is a reality that we have to understand. 
every human being on the planet Earth is going to stand before the Lord. Now, if you did proper re reflection on yourself and you say, okay, if I've got to stand before this holy God, how am I going to fear? And they said this motivated him to persuade others to this gospel. It should motivate us. We should be persuaded in this gospel because we care about others. This is the justice of our God. And last week, Jim, he shared in Isaiah 6, when he gazed upon the majesty of God, what was Isaiah? What was me? We saw in uh, Exodus 3, earlier on in this series, how Moses hid his face before a holy God. We saw how priests fell prostrate in the ground, to the ground in the tabernacle when they become in the presence and the reality of a holy God. See, we, should, we know that God knows us. We should know ourselves. This persuaded him to reach others with this gospel. This motivated him. He had a proper reality about himself. He had a proper reality of how this alone could separate people from God. And living in that reality, 11 continues knowing the fear of the Lord. We persuade others. God knows who we are, and we should know ourselves. This is a stock reality. Ourselves. But it does bring the beauty of the gospel alive. When we read a verse like that, it's hard. Because in our culture, we can say this, and I think this is a real value in the church today, that we don't want people to be afraid of God. So what are they talking about? Paul says this is a good thing, by the way. He's not saying this is a negative thing. So, so what is this? We don't want our children. We don't want anybody to be afraid of God. This is out of reverence for God. This is a healthy thing. Yes. Like if I had to stand in front of God, the reality is I'm done. Without Christ, I'm done. And, and in God's grace, what He's done for us on the cross of Calvary, we can stand. And we should pray, you know, we should persuade us to tell others about this great God, about this holy God. And it changes our message, and I think you'll see this because as this develops, he does this like building a house. We're going to lay a foundation and we're going to keep building upon it with these therefores. Therefore, if we know that every person is going to stand before this God, and if they stand there before God without Christ, it's going to be bad. That should motivate us to share the gospel, especially with the ones we love. Does this reality show up in the church today? Reverence for God and healthy fear. That's just something we have to answer ourselves. But I would say this, go, go to the Bible. The Bible breaks all that reverence for God. That's why God used them. They had a healthy fear of God. And we don't want to raise a generation to have no fear, a healthy fear of reverence for God. But do you see that in churches today? Reverence for God? See, how holiness is viewed. How can you view holiness properly without reverence for God? How can you look upon and understand righteousness, God's righteousness, without reverence for Him? This is Paul's message, the great need. In verse 12, he says, we shouldn't boast about those outward appearances, but look at the heart. Your message of the gospel pure will cut through any darkness. He says, he's the light of the world. He will cut through any darkness. But the way the world evaluates things, it's outward appearance. And sometimes that's the way it is in the church. You get the most money, the church treats you the best. Because you can give the most money to the church. We look at the outward things. But the false apostles at Corinth, they were typical representatives of the world. They took pride in their outward appearances. They looked great. They relied on their self, their knowledge. They loved money, power, and prestige. Sounds like the prosperity gospel, don't it? It's around today. This is the problem they had with Paul. Paul was living a life of suffering for Christ. And they didn't understand it. 
But Paul's life was forever changed. But he was concerned about the heart. I remember I was reading in 1 Samuel 16, 7, and, and um, they were looking for the king. Saul was going to be replaced. And, and Samuel looked, and he saw Eliab. And he saw him, and this guy was big, strong. He said, that's going to be the guy. That's got to be the guy. And what does God say to him? But the Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. And I thank God that God doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> because I have rejected him, he says. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Isn't it great that he had all in mind for, for David? When we live in this reality, it shapes our mind and our heart. It shapes our mind and our heart to a proper reality of what the gospel is truly, truly all about. And it gives us this motivation, the proper motivation of God. And you know what? Everything becomes an opportunity for the gospel. When you know that you're, you are a sinner and it was God himself who saved you, when we look at the world and we look at people, shouldn't it break our heart and say, I want to share this gospel? How do you not know that God is going to give your words, the gospel that you give them to awaken his soul and turn to God? It gives us a proper view and an opportunity for the gospel. That's the heart of Paul and for the church of Corinth. But it is so easy for anybody, even a church, to be so impressed by first impressions. Curbside appeal. But that's not what God looks at. He looks at the heart. It's also motivated in God's love, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and those who live might no longer live for themselves, who lived for their sake, died and was raised. This is Christ's love towards Paul, not Paul's love for Christ. What does it mean to be controlled by Christ's love? Well, we know that it gives many examples of Christ and the body, and it says that Christ is the head. He's the brains. That should motivate the rest of the body to be controlled in God's love. This is God's dramatic expression of love in Jesus Christ. On Paul's behalf, by dying in his place, this changed Paul and his ability to love others. You know, most places he went to, he was in trouble when he got there. That gospel got him in trouble. But this changed Paul. Paul was controlled and motivated in the love of Christ. My prayer for you, my prayer for me that we be controlled by this love. See my words, my witness, my message, your message, your witness, your word, if it is motivated out of the love controlled by Christ, then your message or the gospel is going to have power. Yes. It is going to have power. 1 John 4, 7, 11 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For the love that is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this love of God was made manifest among us, and God sent His Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And in this love, not that we first loved God, but He first loved us, sent His Son to be the, to be the propitiation for our sins, the substitution. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And don't take the world's love with this. This is a love that took great sacrifice. This is a love that's only from God. If you want to be controlled by Christ's love, open up the word of God and know what Christ's love is. It's not the world's love. We don't love because how we look or what we have. No, Christ's love is totally different. And Paul reasoned this in his mind and his heart. And he concluded that the sufficiency of the cross, that Jesus Christ has died for all, and that the result, all have died. 
This is why Paul wrote to the church of Galatia, Galatians 2.20. This is my life verse. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I own it. I hope you own yours. The gospel is meant to change you in the here and now, in eternity. Heart, head, soul. Change you. And the gospel unveils these great truths Biblical doctrine that we both, we must know this. See, faith isn't just blind. There is a knowledge, there's teaching in the Bible for us to know. And if we can't explain the gospels because you don't know the gospel. And, and in this there is some tough, and we've been trying to unveil this thing and unearth this biblical doctrine as we go through this gospel. And this one here, it talks about atonement, the doctrine of atonement. And I want to share with you some things about this because I want you to know it. And, and again, the Doctrine of Atonement is a message all in itself. So I'm just going to put my toe in the water today, okay? I want to see what temperature the water is. And if, if anybody has any questions on anything I share on this, I'd love for you just to reach out to me in the bulletin, my email and my phone number. I'd love to talk to you about this. Because I would call it definite atonement. Other people have words for this. So here's the thing. And I think we'd all agree, if I ask you to raise your hand and say, do you believe heart, mind, and soul the sufficiency of Christ on the cross to cover all sin? Would everybody raise their hand? Well, if he did that, and you believe that, everybody's going to heaven. Because the sufficiency of what God did is for all, right? Right. Is it? But see, we have to understand this. Because my motivation in sharing the gospel is it isn't for all. It's for all who will believe. That's what it says in verse 15. And he died for all that those who will live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, for their sake. See, there's no use for the gospel. There's no use for the cross if you don't believe. But if it was truly, because we can get there, because we want everybody there, right? And this might trouble some of you, and I know this. That's why I want you to call me, and we can talk through this. But if we don't have this right, if we don't have this right in our head, when you're witness someone, why would anybody need to come to Christ? Everybody's going there. And what would you stand on? What would you stand on? Would you say, no, it's all free will? That means every one of you have the ability to salvation. What do you need Christ for of that? That's not the biblical doctrine. The Bible, the Bible says you need Christ. You need Christ crucified. That's the gospel. It's God's plan. It's God's way. And we have to understand that. Because by works, you're not going to be saved. So if it was left up to our will, I know this is hard, isn't it? This is question. I can see the, I see the question marks over the head. And that's okay. This is how you grow in faith. This is how you grow in knowledge of the Lord. Because don't take it from me. I'm just a man. Go to the Word of God, the inspired voice of God, and find it. But what I say to you is don't create your own theology based on what you want. We have to know God. I know that's difficult. But the way that you communicate the gospel depends on what you know. You understand what I'm saying? The atoning work of cross, on the cross for those who would believe. And it's also applied to God, the Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 15, 16. I know I only put my toe in the water, so I apologize. From now on, therefore, Again, here's another therefore. When you get this part right now, he says you're looking back at this. You have an understanding. But you don't know who God would awaken in this. Every opportunity now is an opportunity for the gospel. You know the stark reality from this scripture saying, wait a minute. Everybody's going to stand before this God. 
You have an understanding of this stuff. So it says, therefore, let this motivate you. That this is a work of God through the Holy Spirit. There's something that the Spirit of God needs to do. It's so important. He says, now we were done knowing according to the flesh. It means I don't look at the outward appearance. You don't look at the outward appearance of anyone. It could be someone sitting on the side of the road. It could be someone homeless. Do we condemn people? No, we want to come with the gospel. If we, do, we look at people and we choose who we're going to be doing it, you're becoming God. Instead of working through the Holy Spirit, just allowing Him wherever you walk, you carry this great message of hope. He says He doesn't accord it. He doesn't, he doesn't look at anyone according to the flesh, even though once you knew God in Christ that way. And He did. You remember Stephen with the clothes all at his feet like he was of honor. Saul at that time thought Christ was a blasphemer against God. He thought he was a false guy. He thought he was a, a, a manipulator. He thought he was a, someone who needed to die. And anybody who followed me, they should die also. But then there was Damascus. And on that road, in the intersection with God himself, God awoke in his heart, his soul, his mind blinded his eyes so that he could receive the very word of God and he changed him. Changed him into a new creation. The old had passed away and the new had come. This is the gospel in the entirety. This is the reality of it. When it comes clear to us that God is not a concept that we're all going to stand there this reality of God, we can realize and humbly say, listen, we're not like so great a people that God came to us. Paul was offered. He was zealous at this. And he says, now I count all things rubbish the garbage that I was doing. Because God has changed me. And this is the justice of God. And when you get this solidified in you, and you realize this great love that God has, that he had for me, the scripture says, from the foundations of the world, the sacrificial love of Christ, that he would lay down his life for us. We weren't worth it. He says, therefore, therefore, shouldn't I desire to love God with all my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength? And to love others? When the reality of this great love is rooted in you, that Christ died for you, therefore, therefore, shouldn't you live for him? It says we were God known by the flesh, even though there was a time when Paul regarded him this way. Paul now sees with eyes differently. It's an opportunity for the gospel, and he's willing to suffer for it. That's his life. This is a new creation that Jesus told Nicodemus about. The new creation reconciled to God fully. One lives, moves, and has his being standing upon God's grace. Irresistible grace. In Christ alone, through faith alone. For God's glory alone. This is life changing. It's like, you know, like when you realize you need glasses when you're getting old, like me when I started, I couldn't see things very well. And you realize when you fight it and fight it and fight it to go get glasses, and then finally you do it and you go, ooh, everything looks pretty good. <laughs> this is what the gospel is meant to do to your heart. And I want to give you an example of this. And this one troubles me more than anything. You know, whoop, I think I just lit myself up. <laughs> what am I doing here? Wrong. Okay, the hands are going up in the air. <laughs> you know, um, Franklin Grant's been going across New England with the gospel to awaken people to the gospel. For America, I don't know if you realize the severity of America right now. In the eyes of God. Not in my eyes. In the eyes of God. And he's trying to, and again, he's trying to, uh, whether you're a fan or not a fan, that's not important to me, but he's trying to awake America to the purpose of God and look at everything. Open up your window and just look at God 
everything, if we have our eyes focused upon God, what that can do. And he's asked something of America, which I don't even think America can do. He's asked something. Church, this is something I'd like to ask you. I want you to know I will never use this pulpit for politics. I won't. This pulpit is designed and it's for him and him alone. But I would say to you, this is what he's asking. And this is why I think it can't happen. He's asking everybody to pray for President Trump. And I've got to tell you something. And this is just my observation. I've never heard so many Christians hate a man as they hate him. What did First John say? Now, I'm not asking you to be a Trump fan. Okay? I'm not. What I'm asking you as a Christ follower is that there should be an opportunity for the gospel. Amen. And that we can think and we can pray for him. I don't care what I have on. I don't want to care what coat you wear. We serve one God. He is our king. And we should be praying for our country. And for but if you hate him, are you in Christ? None of us are going to agree with all the stuff, right? Forget it. Listen, there will be no president enter the White House that's going to fix what only God can fix. Amen. Okay? So if you think that there's somebody else out there, I think you're thinking wrong. And I would say this, if you're one of those ones that write this way on Facebook, I don't know if you know God. I honestly don't know. Because... Our country, our kids, babies, the world looks at our country because we've been so blessed by God and we need to return to God. Amen. And the church should be the message of hope through the gospel. Not a political message. A message of hope through the gospel. It's also the first and foremost from God through Christ and represented in us. In 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says, It is all from God. Oh boy, here we go. I'm going to really wrap this up quick. Through Christ, and He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God entrusted to us this message of reconciliation. This message that we have is not, hey, let's all get along. That's the political message, by the way. No, it's not that. It's that we were sinners, and we needed a redeemer. And that there is a way Jesus Christ can redeem sinners and save them. That's the message of reconciliation, that we can be reconciled back to a holy God. That's the message He's given us. It's not like, hey, can we all get along? It's the message of hope. When was the last time you implored someone on behalf of Jesus Christ? The very word of the gospel that will awaken the soul of a person. This is the gospel plea. We need to examine ourselves in the light of God's holiness. Who could stand really without Christ? This is the true gospel. And I want to end it here. The one true gospel says, For our sake, for the sake of all who would believe, this God is initiating work. He made him, God, Christ, to be sin. The very thing that broke humanity's relationship with God, He made Christ to be the shame and the despise for you. He knew no sin. He was the spotless lamb. His mind had no imperfect thoughts. He lived a perfect life. He served His Father perfectly. He was perfect in holiness. And he made him sin. You feel this in you. Like you, do, you do you understand like, the weight of this gospel? All the things that we should carry all the way to standing before a holy God. He took all those things and weighted it on the perfect, spotless, obedient son for you. This is the great exchange. God imputes our sin in Him, Christ. So Christ's perfect righteousness is given to you. Freely by God. I hope this motivates you this morning to evangelism. 
This is evangelism. The result, every Christ follower possesses. This is what you have. I want you to know, Christ follower, what you have. You possess legally the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed by God and received in faith. You have it. Because there is a way. God's redemptive plan. Someone wants to know the way? There is a way. There is a truth which points to the one Christ. The cross, His death, His resurrection. There is a life through Christ imputed to you righteousness of heaven. So my question to you this morning is, and I'm going to borrow a tagline from Behold Your God, do you live in the results of the gospel or do you live in the yes but? Do you live in the results of the gospel in humility, changing your heart and mind and soul towards him? That this love controls you, motivates you, energizes you, implores you to speak to others in this great beauty of Christ? Or is it, yes, but? That sounds good, but you know what my church believes is rituals and sacraments. Which one do you live in? Do you live in the results of the transforming work of the Holy Spirit that everyone you see is an opportunity for this gospel? That this new thought comes from the new creation, a new spirit, and a new heart that God gave you? Or do you live in the yes, but? I'm trying to be a good person. But my church, you know, they teach that born again stuff? Not so much. Not really. Do you live in the results of the gospel as a message bearer, an ambassador for Christ, representing Him, Him alone, imploring others to turn to God through Christ to repent and believe? Or do you live in the yes, but? That sounds good. But I hope at the end, God will look at everything that I did and He'll have mercy on me. Which one of you? See, today I'm here to employ you on behalf of Jesus Christ to repent and believe. That is the call of the pulp of God. So as I conclude in prayer this morning, this is what I would ask, as I've already gone over. Who are you really before God? Who are you? So easy to be that yes but. Hey, use him. Sounds all good evangelism, but yes but. Which one are you? Who are you? Examine yourself this morning. And if the Holy Spirit prompts you this morning, because I believe in my heart, the Lord's been, I gotta tell you, I've been, when I started reading this, and I was away from you folks, I was weeping. That I believe that there is some here that wants to let all this go and wants to follow Christ, but they're holding on to something. I don't know what it is, but as I pray for you, and as I was praying for you by name, he gave me these little snapshots of you face, your beautiful faces. And as I was praying, I was just saying, Lord, release this today, if it's your will. So if the Holy Spirit prompts you this morning, from your heart to His, ask for forgiveness of your sin. Be sure. Trust Him to lead your life today. Just like the kids when they're in the pool. Would you like a trust? They were staying in the low end. God wants you to swim. God wants you to move and have your being in Him. He wants you to trust Him. Amen. Ask Him to lead your life. Romans 10, 9 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, it says, You will be saved. Legally possessing heaven and the righteousness of God. Let's pray.